You are listening to Megiddo Radio. Megiddo Radio is a radio ministry of Megiddo Films. For more, visit our website at www.megiddofilms.org. Good everybody, welcome. This is Paul Flynn with Megiddo Radio for the 3rd of October, 2015. On this week's show, we're going to be dealing with Pope Francis once again. Now, I've been doing, I think I've done the odd vlog. I did the odd vlog. I did one vlog since he, since his visit to the United States. It's a historic visit, of course. And I remember when I saw the visit, I was like, oh, well, another country yet under the thumb of the Pope. Now, but it also occurred to me that many, many people are, do not see what is so wrong with the Roman Catholic Church system. They do not, they do not see the problem with the papacy. And so I kind of wanted to do this show today. Now, Part of it was prompted by comments made on Fox. It was on Hannity's, on Fox News' channel, uh, Sean Hannity's program. It was a man by the name of Robert Jeffries, who was a pastor in First Baptist Church in Dallas. Uh, and he made, I'm just going to play this clip now at the start, the comments that he made, for, and he's in the Southern Baptist Convention. And he's a Baptist pastor. And let's just listen to what he says here about the Pope. Geraldo, of all, all people, Dr. Jeffers had a great idea, and he said, and I don't mean that against my friend Geraldo, but he had a great idea. Have a Syrian refugee safe zone in Syria, and we can provide humanitarian <laughs> assistance. Um, what is your reaction as an evangelical to the Pope's yeah. positions on immigration, the refugees, climate change, economic justice, and, and arms trading? Look, let me say very clearly, I have great respect for Pope Francis. He's a humble Christ follower. We all can learn for him, from him. And I think, Sean, whenever... Wow. Just before we get into this, uh, I, I knew a little bit about Robert Jeffries before. I, I saw him on television one time. Somebody shared it on their YouTube channel, and he pretty much thoroughly refuted a, a homosexual pastor an absolute heretic. And so obviously, Jeffers has been through his Bible more than once, and he quoted scripture, and he sounded really good at that time. And I, I'm not that well aware of him, to be honest. I, I've only heard him a few times, and another time he spoke out against Islam, which is great. I mean, Islam is a satanic religion, that attacks the deity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It, I mean, equivalent. I'm not an expert on Islam, but I think anybody who's studied it, even to a small degree, realizes it's not a religion of peace. It talks about uh, war conquest and and violent warfare to conquer the world for Islam. And he spoke out against that as well, from what I know. I, I don't I don't know a huge amount of details. But so when I heard this, I was like, whoa. Now, the thing about it is, these comments are not the only time he's made these kind of comments. He made the same kind of comments. I don't have the clip here, but at the end of Benedict's reign of terror, um, he said the same thing. Words to that effect, and he hopes that somebody of equal standing, etc. and so on, will take up after him. He obviously has a lot of respect for the Pope. Now, the question is, in 2015, is the Reformation irrelevant? Now, the problem is, here's the thing, right? Most people, I think well, people started saying over 100 years ago, oh, I'm not a Protestant anymore, I'm just a Christian. And became thinking, oh, well, that belief that Rome is the Antichrist, or the the, the papacy is the Antichrist, well, that's an overreaction against Rome. We have drifted, sadly, to a pre-Reformation position. I think uh, David Martin Lay jones in a number of his sermons, and I think his books as well, was worried about that, that that's the direction we were going. We were going to pre-Reformation. 
The problem is, and the sad thing that I've noticed is, it's often the most proud academic so-called Calvinists, and I say so-called because their application is really poor, it can either be hyper-Calvinism, which doesn't deserve the name at all, or it can be Arminianism, but just pays a kind of lip service towards the doctrines of grace. That's what I see all around. And there's this kind of pride that, oh, well, that wouldn't happen in our circles. We're, we're, we're too good for that. There's a pride. Pride cometh before the fall. Um... May we be humble towards thinking we can never enter into error. But uh, Jeffries has made comments like this before. How should we view the Pope of Rome? Because if what Jeffries is saying here is true, Martin Luther, John Calvin, Jonathan Edwards, the King James Bible translators, Theodore Beza, we could go on and on with those lists. Uh, Hugh Latimer are all in grave error because they saw the Pope of Rome as the Antichrist. But even, well, when you say that, this is what the scriptures de declare. I mean, before I came on, I was thinking, okay, I'll just focus on other arguments. But here's the thing. And I spent other shows going through why the Pope of Rome is the Antichrist, the papacy. This is why the Westminster, this is why all the confessional creeds, pretty much, bar one or two of them, held that the papacy, that the Pope of Rome was the Antichrist, the son of perdition, that man of sin who exalts himself above God, and above all, and, and you might think, well, what's the point of pointing this out? Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 to 5, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and everything that exalted itself about, against the knowledge of God, and, again, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of God. Christ, it's so important that we do not allow, and, and, and what, what that passage is talking about is anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. The Pope of Rome, look, even if you don't believe that the Pope of Rome is the Antichrist, here's the thing, it doesn't, does he not fit perfectly with the description? Does he not exalt himself and declare him to be above all gods? We'll go through the passages in a while. But this is a logismos, an idea, an ideology that raises itself against the knowledge of Christ. This man claims to be Vicarious Christi, another Christ. And I think everybody will at least admit he's at least an Antichrist. We've got any theological sense. And we need, as Christians, to cast down imaginations and everything that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. This man claims to be a pastor. We'll continue. The Pope is standing up and he's speaking about the right to life and the sanctity of marriage and religious freedom. All evangelicals are applauding because he's speaking from the authority of God's word. I do think when he starts talking about armed... All evangelicals, this evangelical is not applauding. You know, a broken clock is right twice a day. Just because somebody who blasphemes God says something that's true every now and again, it does not mean that they believe the Bible. We'll go through in a while. The Jesuits are not to be trusted. Pope Francis is a Jesuit. And through their casuistry and sophistry, cl basically cleverly sounding arguments to confuse and bamboozle and to eradicate morality, there's a kind of a moral subjectivity. They don't believe in moral absolutes at all. If you look at the books written by more casuists who are Jesuits, they would, you know, how they would absolve the sins in the confessional, 
based on case law. That's what casuist mean, casuist means about looking at various cases. But it wasn't comparing scripture with scripture. It was using man's knowledge, and even the casuists didn't even agree with each other themselves. And sophistry, these, ca- you know, basically, you know, when you read articles and all these quotations and all these points that individually are true, but you're most of the time people are so confused by the arguments, they kind of go, well, this guy seems to know what he's talking about. And the Jesuits use these types of tactics. And they have things like me- mental reservation, probabilism. They can justify almost anything with their theology. The ends justify the means. Now, that was not coined by the Jesuits, it comes from Machiavelli, but that's very much a maxim that suits the Jesuits. They will employ any means necessary to reach their objective. controlling climate change. Many say he's moving maybe more into the realm of personal opinion, but something I heard him say today I thought was key, and that's the word balance. And I think, for example, we have to balance our concern for immigrants with the biblical role of government to protect its citizens. Yeah, by the we way, have to balance our belief for the sanctity of life with the very real belief that capital punishment is right. And this is key, Sean. We need to balance a concern for the environment, which is a biblical value. We should, re- with we the should truth. be good stewards of God's gifts. I agree. And by the yes, way, but David God, but, but God created with a weapon, a slingshot right. and a rock that God oh, come provided. come on, Sean. Sean. Are you Father. kidding me? You're yeah. going to you're going to uh, Let me what, go to Saint Paul. Okay, this is going to another part of the clip. And just give you a bit of information on who Gr- Robert Jeffries is. He is senior pastor of and it's this is not to my knowledge at least an openly liberal institution at least not yet. He is a se- the senior pastor of a 12,000-member First Baptist Church, Dallas, Texas, and a Fox News contributor. He's regularly on Fox News. He's also an adjunct professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. Now, he's not in the faculty, but he he seems to go there from time to time. Dallas Theological Seminary. Is the church not in trouble? Now, again, this is not the first time he's made comments like this. And this is a direct result, I believe, from the way, not just how we view the Antichrist, that doctrine, but also how we view free will and how we have drifted away from the Reformed position of Calvinism. The man is dead in trespasses and sins. No longer, we now defend free will. We are now on the side of Rome, by and large. The majority of the church is on the side of Rome. It fights vehemently and agrees more with Pelagians, semi-Pelagians, the Jesuits, Molinists. I mean, I was watching... I'm probably going to do a show on Molinism at some stage, maybe in a few months. I've got... De Molina's book, actually, from his famous Concordia something. I you know it's in Latin, so I'm not. Even, it's on divine foreknowledge, anyway. And I have the book up on shelf, and it's on my to read list. A lot of it's to do with the next film I'm doing, which deals a lot with free will. Lord willing, will be out next year. If you keep that in your prayers, I'd re- I would really appreciate that. But I was watching. Act 17 Apologetics, who do a lot of great work when it comes to Islam. I really enjoy their videos when it comes to, I think, David David Woods. And when it comes to Islam, you know, I I am not... Uh, Islam was one of those areas I just kind of left, and I said, I am not going to cover it on the radio show. Not because I don't want to cover it, I, I do, but just for the sake of time, it is such a big area, and when people get into refuting it and exposing it, the amount of books and resources and investment that goes into studying something like that. One day I think I will, maybe in 10 years, 20 years, Lord willing, if I'm still doing this, and hopefully I will be, by the grace of God. But I, I really enjoy, you know, listening to David Woods and Acts 17 Apologetics when it comes to Islam. However, 
however, um, he was interviewing William Lane Craig, and this is, I don't think, 10 months ago, and it's on their YouTube channel, and it's a few minutes, and he's talking at this convention. I don't know what the actual meeting was, but I digress, it's not that important. He was interviewing, just for a few minutes, William Lane Craig and what is Molinism, and and it came up the fact that this came from Luis de Molina, the Jesuit priest whose doctrine of free will and middle knowledge and predestination, and you know, that's a Jesuit staple to, still to this day, more or less, and is defended vehemently, that this is the solution to our problems. And William Lane Craig says at the end of it that, well... It's okay because, well, I'm kind of paraphrasing him a little bit here. Because, well, Arminianism is just a Molinism entered into Protestantism. And you have to shake your head. It's just like, wow. We could read the opening part of the Council of Trent. Many evangelicals could today and say, well, have we gotten Rome wrong? And I think this is where the slide has come. If we do not take the doctrines of grace, seriously, the slide, and this is not why we do it, we do it because it's truth, that it's in the word of God, but when the slide goes, it goes towards Rome. I, the only people I see preaching, street preaching, or protesting against the abuses of the Church of Rome are Calvinists. I never see, at least not in this country, probably in other countries they do it, but I never see Armenians doing it. I very rarely see I've never, I don't think I've ever seen an Armenian. A lot of times, Armenians, especially dispensationalists, they kind of almost go, well, the world's going to get worse and worse, so why bother? Now, they don't say it in, su- in such words, but it's almost like they're resigned to grab a few souls before we just get raptured any minute. <laughs> and I think people have seen that. Okay. And it's... It's tragic. You know, even if you could say the pre-trib rapture and all this kind of stuff is true, if I grant that, you don't know that we will be here for another couple hundred years or 200 years or whatever, but people are... I mean, I heard stories of people who be had their pets ready to give to neighbors in the case of them being raptured out of here and all this kind of silliness. But anyway... Let's return to Grand Jeffries. How should we view the Pope of Rome? How should we view Francis? Is he really a sincere Christ follower as Robert Jeffries believes? Say, Dr. Jeffries can explain what St. Paul said. Well, he said it's better uh, to get married than to burn. Uh, no, he to also said, he all, well, that's right. Well, go ahead, Dr. And, and Sean, Sean and, and of course, in 1 Timothy 3, the Bible says that the pastor is to be the husband of one wife. So their marriage is something to be celebrated. Amen. But I've got to say that I've got to say this, and that is with the differences we might have with Pope Francis on some of these secondary issues, I'm not going to quibble about secondary issues. I think his name is actually pronounced Jeffress. But anyway, um, it's not a name that's very familiar to me. Secondary issues? <laughs> what kind of secondary issues? Uh, oh! Let's just read from the Council of Trent. That's still authoritative, by the way. W- Vatican II was just window dressing. All they did was change a few things. They annoyed a few people who believed in the Latin, Latin Mass. But the very core of what they believe has not changed. The, the Council of Trent, which I'll be quoting from here, took place between the years... 1545 and 1563, spearheaded by the Jesuits in order, which and they spearheaded, and they were the, the main battering ram of the Counter-Reformation. And Pope Francis is a Jesuit. And has been a, a very high-ranking Jesuit. I, I read some news stories there a few, a few days ago. But basically, he is... A very high rank. He was a very high ranking Jesuit in Argentina. I don't think we can necessarily know how far he goes up. What does the what does the Council of Trent affirm? In Canon Twelve, 
it says, this is on justification, secondary issue, is this a secondary issue? If you agree with Rome, you're preaching a false gospel. And according to Galatians 1, verses 8 and 9, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, or any angel of heaven or anything else, let him be accursed, let him be cut off from the church. This is not secondary, this is the gospel. They disagree on the gospel. Rome, he is the head of an institution that has burned Christians during the inst- Inquisition. Never really apologized for that. It's it still, I mean, they used to boast about it up until, I don't know, term Vatican II. It attempted through Hitler to conquer Europe through various agreements and concordats that they, well, they still engage in those. A, and I don't expect uh, Robert Jeffress to know about Rwanda and the genocide that Rome was part of. But this Rome has not changed. I don't want to be expecting the pastors to know everything. But surely something like, oh, I don't know, the Reformation kind of came across he studies at some stage in church history. And what Rome actually believes, if you have no idea what Rome believes, it doesn't take very long. For example, just read some of the canons from the Council of Trent. Never been repudiated. Ever. It says in Canon 12, this is from the sixth session concerning justification, if anyone says that justifying faith is nothing less then confidence in, di- in divine mercy, which sin- which remits sins for Christ's sake, or that is, it is this confidence alone that justifies us, let him be anathema. And look at the last part. Or that is this confidence alone, or faith alone, that justifies us, let him be anathema. They deny faith alone. Just re- read the r- early part again, because sometimes you can read over this and can kind of run over your head. If anyone says, anyone that justifying faith is nothing else than confidence in divine mercy and trusting in the mercy of God, which remits sins for Christ's sake. If you believe that, you're accursed, according to Rome. This Is this a secondary issue? And you might say, oh, well, he might not know this. Seriously, this is not a new issue. What was the Reformation for at all? But most people don't identify with the Reformation anymore. They identify with the Radical Reformation, the Anti-Reformation of the Anabaptists, unfortunately. Canons Concerning Justification. Uh, This is canon number 24. If anyone says that the justice received is not preserved and also not increased before God through good works, but that those works are merely the fruits and signs of justification obtained, but not the cause of its increase, let him be anathema. So if you believe that good works have nothing to do with justification, but are merely the fruits of it, and that good works don't increase the grace, let him be anathema. So in these two canons, I mean, you don't have to read all of the Council of Trent, just read the canons. Read what it anathematizes. Justification. Um, on, on for, for example, do, 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 let's just see what else. If anybody says the baptism is not necessary for salvation, let it be anathema. According to Rome, you must have you must be baptized to be saved. Um, and you can go on and on. Are these secondary issues? This is salvation. This is the very core of the gospel. And this was the wonderful thing about the unity of faith, which was seen in the Westminster Confession of Faith, in the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, Savoy Declaration. Of course, there were splits and problems and stuff, uh, things that people disagreed with in, in these creeds at times. But the gospel, they agreed on. There's that wonderful unity. 
Secondary issues, maybe, mm, maybe he just, you know, has a different view of eschatology. Maybe he's post millennial, I'm a millennial, or something like that. That maybe you could call it a secondary issue. But the gospel, Robert Jeffress, do you not know that Rome preaches another gospel? And that this man, like Benedict before him, who you praised and lavished praise upon, are enemies of Christ. And they are antichrists. Of that, because here's the fact as this world becomes increasingly darker, I find myself having much more in common with my Catholic friends than I even do with liberal Baptists, because the fact is we are fighting together against a common well, you know enemy, That's the kingdom thing. of darkness. I just we are fighting together. Who's there? Sean Hannity, a Roman Catholic. Well, Fox News is completely Roman Catholic. And I covered this in a radio show, I don't know, maybe it was two years ago at this point, talking about Fox News is a Roman Catholic station. For example, the, the Roman Catholic Church awarded back in 1998 Rupert Murdoch with the knighthood of... St. Gregory, which is a papal knighthood. And still, Roman Catholics are still kind of scratching their heads and going, why is this professed atheist? Sure, he's donated a lot of money towards building of, I think, the cathedral in Los Angeles he built. Uh, I think it was $10 million. Actually, I'll read an article here from the Catholic Herald. This is from the, I think it's from July of 2011. It states, debate should Rupert Murdoch's papal knighthood be rescinded. In 1998, Rupert Murdoch was, a, was made a knight commander of St. Gregory. He had apparently been recommended for the honor by Cardinal Roger Mahoney. Or Mahoney, as we say it here. I think in, the, in America it's Mahoney they pronounce it. After giving money to a church education fund. A year later, he donated $10 million to help build Los Angeles Catholic Cathedral. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it just happens. You know, like his entire news organization just happens to be Roman Catholic. I mean, people are seeing it more and more, you know, when all the time people are referring to the Pope as Holy Father this, Holy Father that. There's one Holy Father, and that's God the Father. No humble Christ follower would ever take that title, knowing it was also the title of God, but he believes, Francis believes, like every other pope before him, going back right to, uh, right back to was Boniface III in the, in the 7th century, that he is Christ's representative, that he is he's God Almighty on earth. He is the representative. He is in Christ's place. He believes that ever since Vatican I, and it became a dogma then, but it was believed before then as well, various times, even though it was challenged even within the Catholic Church, that the, the Pope is infallible when speaking on issues of faith and dogma ex cathedra. He is infallible. So not only is he claiming to be Holy Father, he's claiming to be infallible. He says he is Victor Vicarius Christi. And he took the title, which was given to Roman Caesars before it was taken by the Bishop of Rome, Pontifax Maximus, a Latin term which means ultimate bridge builder. Because he sees himself as the ultimate bridge builder between God and man. Between man and God. Rome also believes, especially in modern times, that Mary, also, you know, the mother of God thing and all that, but that she is co mediatrix, co mediator. Are these secondary issues? If somebody believes this, 
Can they be a good Christian? Can they be saved? No. You'll know them by their fruits. And if there are Roman Catholics listening to this, look, I was raised Roman Catholic. I, I loved the Roman Catholic Church. I loved being altar boy when I was a child. I never had a bad experience as a child. I loved it too much. I remember I... I didn't... I, I wasn't, like, cynical towards different things. When I was a child, I prayed in the morning, prayed in the evening. I thought it was great for going to Mass every Sunday. Now, eventually I left when I was about 18 and 19. I, I remember an atheist friend of mine at the time challenged me, why did I believe that? And I didn't have an answer. And eventually I was like, well, this is all nonsense. And I pretty much became an, you know, agnostic, agnostic atheist, professing atheist, whatever you want to call it. Until I got into much darker things down the line. Hated the God of the Bible. Rebelled against him. Hated the God of Catholicism as well, which is another God entirely. And went into more and more aspiring. Because the issue was, I was dead in trespass and sins. I hadn't been born again. And I say to you, if you're a Roman Catholic, I reiterate Jesus' admonition to the religious Jew Nicodemus. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, you must be born again. And the problem is, if the blind lead the blind, if you are following this man, Pope Francis, Jorge Bargoglio, or any other man, for that matter, and not the word of God, then the blind shall lead the blind. Won't they both fall into the ditch? If we do not have the light of God's word, we are stumbling around in the dark. None of us, myself included, more than most chief of sinners, I know my own depravity in my own heart. We know that nothing we can merit, like our greatest deeds, the, uh, the prophet Isaiah tells us, are but filthy rags. Our greatest deeds, nothing, you know, when you're, as a Roman Catholic, and if you really believe Roman Catholic doctrine, and that it's a cooperation between grace to enable and works and your own will to for the for justification then you're just storing up wrath for yourself justification is a legal declaration before God the Father and on this issue this central issue the doctrine upon which the church either falls or stands has now been relegated to a secondary issue by the church. It has been replaced, unfortunately, rather than going to faithful catechisms and creeds, which go through the you know the biblical proof texts, etc., such as the Westminster Standards, we would rather replace it with quick slogans because we <laughs> we we think we can reinvent the wheel. And those Christians before us, they hadn't a clue what they were talking about. Such arrogance in the church today. Will we at least read the thoughts of other men's brains? And as Spurgeon said, you know, he will not read other men's works. Or read the thoughts of other men's brain. I'm kind of paraphrasing here. Shows that he has no brains of his own. Now, Fox News is completely Roman Catholic, and how many people have I met from the United States who are just, Fox News says it, it must be true. They have developed a Roman Catholic view of foreign policy. I don't have time to get into that here, but it's kind of like holy war, but in Roman Catholic style, but using the U.S. military. I'm all for warfare, we're not, we're supposed to serve 
government, if you're a soldier, you continue to be a soldier. This is not to go against soldiers or anything like that. I mean, people are, if you're in the army, you serve. You serve, uh, you, you be the best soldier you can be. Um, but the thing is, Anyway, I could get into that issue of uh, Manichaean views of world politics and all this kind of stuff. But the, suffice to say is we need not to follow conser so-called conservative politics and the lowest common denominator of the next great savior of the country or whoever it is, you know, be it Donald Trump or anybody else or Rick Santorum, because so many people are compromising. Look, I will not vote for a politician, unless they declare their allegiance to Jesus Christ, unless they declare that the laws of the land will be made in accordance with God's word. How dare we have the audacity to say we think, well, God's law does not matter in the state. His moral law does not matter in the state. That the Ten Commandments are to be put aside because we're at the state. And this is Caesar's realm. I can't fathom it. But anyway. I just wish he would appeal to people's greater spiritual needs than, than stay out yeah. of the political realm. But I've got to run. Father, I, I guess I'm going to have to go to confession after this. No. But, uh, it's okay to disagree with the Pope. All right. I agree. But so I, I don't know why my Catholic guilt is coming. Oh, come in. on. All right. <laughs> thank you. It's a congregation. And by the way, you have a right to. Just want to play now. This. No. Jeff. Robert Jeffries made these comments in 2010. Now, it's relating to Islam, but it's very pertinent. Often you can judge people not by the. He is exhorting us to refute him. Listen here. No, whether your pastor knows what he's talking about when he stands behind this pulpit. You have every right to know. Am I just speaking off the cuff? Am I uh, shooting from the hip? Or am I speaking facts? I take this ministry very, very seriously. And I take what I say behind this pulpit very, very seriously. And I make sure I'm speaking from the facts when I speak to you every Sunday. You have a right, according to Robert Jeffers. Now, what else? I mean, is... Who is Pope Francis? I mean, we... I mean, it doesn't matter what news outlet you seem to go to. No, okay. Fox News and stuff will criticize him on the climate change thing, and he will get criticism from the conservatives. But when it comes down to it, if you look at the Congress, the U.S. Congress, the that man of sin, he enters into the Congress, and everyone's clapping. Everyone's cheering. I think there's even tears from some of the con congressmen in there. They wondered after him. They are in awe of him. Go to Second Thessalonians, chapter two, to see what is going on. Let no man deceive you. Verse three: That day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that happened in the first few centuries, which led to the Roman Catholic Church state, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, after the fall of the Roman Empire, who oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that as God sitted in the temple of God, temple of God is the Greek term, uh, escapes me at the moment, but it only refers to the inner sanctuary, or the spiritual temple, not the physical temple, just two different Greek terms. I think it's neos. Now, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withhold, what withhold it that he might be revealed at this time. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The Holy Spirit cannot be taken 
out of the way. But we've already covered this in previous shows. I think it was at the end of 2014. I think it was around September. A little over a year ago, I did a couple of shows on the Antichrist. If you go into YouTube or even onto megidafilms.org and type in the word Antichrist into the search bar, uh, you should be able to find it. And there's even a playlist as well of three radio shows to listen to to understand this view of Scripture, to understand why this cannot be referring to a future Antichrist. Cannot be. And then that shall a wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan will have power and signs and lying wonders. With all deceivableness and righteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, they may, might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion. This is the judgment of God upon them. That they should believe a lie. You see the blindness of heart that the men, the men show and that they worship a mere man treating him as if he is God. Now the papacy emerged from God's people prior to Boniface the third in the seventh century, I think it was 601, uh, 606, 607 AD, prior to him taking the title of universal bishop, Gregory the first, or known to history as Gregory the Great, stated that for a man, and again I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, that for a man to take such a title to himself, it is the forerunner of Antichrist forerunner of Antichrist. This is what Gregory said. And he was having debates or writings of correspondence, whatever the case was at the time, with John of Con Constantinople. This John of Constantinople took that title. Gregory did not believe that the po or the Bishop of Rome was in any way, the universal bishop. And it was the forerunner of Antichrist in order to take that title. He did not mince his words. Prior to that, you had various, some decent bishops of Rome, some heretical ones. There was some good rulings in the early councils, up until about the 500s, Council of Orange, the um, Chalcedonian Creed, things like that. Some of the rulings are very good. Some of the rulings are Calvinistic. But it changed from around that time onwards. It, it condemned Pelagianism in the 4th century. But as time went on, Rome become, became more and more influenced by the doctrine of free will. Became semi-Pelagian. Rome is not, I want to state this, Rome is not Augustinian when it comes to the doctrine of grace. Rome likes to pay lip service to Augustine much of the time. But this whole ludicrous argument of, well, Calvin got his doctrine of grace from Augustine, even though if you actually read Calvin's Institutes, it's quite clear that Calvin doesn't always agree with Augustine, but I digress. Um, or agree with anybody. Just that, you know, in the early 16th century, what do you have to quote from and who do you have to talk about up until that point, you didn't have a big raft of Reformed theologians at his disposal. You had Cyprian, you had Augustine, you had all these early church fathers. But he didn't slavishly stick to any of them, and actually he refuted them a lot of the time. And actually his letter to the King of France at the time shows that he didn't stick to it, them at all. He actually warned of the dangers in, in the church fathers, but hey, who's got time to read I mean, it's so infuriating to keep hearing this ludicrous charge, especially from fundamental Baptists, who state that Protestantism is some daughter of Rome. It, it's like one step away from Baptist writers, writer kind of theology. Because if you believe that, you believe that none, nothing in Pro, the Protestantism, that my church or any other faithful church or, or any other church that's Presbyterian or anything else, they're not in the true church. 
That's what a Baptist brighter believes. And even though people will say, well, I'm not a Baptist brighter, they will believe many of the things that if you just take it a little bit logically far farther. Oh, and I mean, you get this from people who should know better. But I digress. We need to understand who Rome is. I mean, most of these people don't even want to engage with Rome anymore. They don't care. They don't think it's important. Whereas we should pray for the destruction of Antichrist, for the destruction of Islam, for the ingathering, as the, the Westminster divines it, uh, the ingathering of the, of the Jews according to the flesh into spiritual Israel. And that the glory of the Lord would cover the earth as the water covers the seas. I want to give you a bit more information on how much time have we got? Have we left? About 15 minutes left. I'm going to try and keep this to about an hour. The Pope of Rome for centuries. See, it may seem shocking to people that the Pope sees himself as God Almighty. But so, oh no, that's not true. This is a historical fact that goes back for centuries. Now they have, you know, using probably a lot of Jesuit argumentation styles like mental reservation. You know, you can, full, you can, for example, swear a false oath as long as you can say the words in your head and not mean them. I'm going to play a clip here from Chris Pinto's film A Lamp in the Dark. Now, I'm going to I'm going to take some of the images out. Unfortunately, A Lamp in the Dark does not is not really faithful to the second commandment. There is an actor used, sadly, I'm a I really like Chris Pinto, but we have to be zealous for the law of God. And um, this is an excellent movie. The only big blight against it is the violation of the second commandment in it. And I don't know if, if Chris recognizes that. Like, I mean, I have his, the next film that came out, which was Tears Among the Wheat. Excellent film as well. But we have to get serious about this. It is blasphemous to have images of Christ. We are supposed to show no similitude of any member of the Godhead with the, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We have the Word of God. He is the Word of God. We are we're not, not any symbols of the Trinity, any of this stuff. This is forbidden in the Second Commandment. And we're going to play, this is from 91 minutes into this movie, A Lamp in the Dark. And let's hear what various quotations throughout history from many people on or the, the blasphemous claims made by the Pope of Rome, various popes of Rome, they are God Almighty. Early Christians and the Reformers were very familiar with the blasphemous declarations from the papacy, which were often the subject of intense debate because from ancient times, the popes had declared themselves to be equal to God. Jesus said, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Yet the popes took to themselves the name Holy Father, along with all claims of authority that might be assumed by such a title. Pope Innocent III, who fathered the Inquisition, said, The Pope holdeth place on earth, not simply of a man, but of the true God. Meanwhile, Pope Nicholas said of himself, I am in all and above all, so that God himself and I, the Vicar of God, hath both one consistory, and I am able to do almost all that God can do. I then, being above all, seem by this reason to be above all gods. Nicholas even claimed that the popes had the power to change the gospel itself, saying, Wherefore, no marvel, if it be in my power to dispense with all things, 
yea, with the precepts of Christ. But in the Bible, Jesus says, Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, and no man openeth. The Apostle Paul warned that if any man or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, let him be accursed. Yet despite these biblical warnings, the popes repeatedly claimed they were equal to and above God, and were even called by Catholics our Lord God, the Pope. The Lateran Council, while addressing Pope Julius II, said to him, Take care that we lose not that salvation, that life and breath which thou hast given us. For thou art shepherd, thou art physician, thou art governor, thou art husbandman, thou finally art another God on earth. In the 19th century, Cardinal Giuseppe Sarto, who would later become Pope Pius X, declared, The Pope is not simply the representative of Jesus Christ. On the contrary, he is Jesus Christ himself, under the veil of the flesh. Does the Pope speak? It is Jesus Christ who is speaking. Hence, when anyone speaks of the Pope, it is not necessary to examine, but to obey. Jesus said of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Yet Pope Pius IX blasphemously declared, I alone am the successor of the apostles, the vicar of Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The popes have not only made claims to be God, but have insisted that salvation itself depends directly upon obedience to them. Pope Boniface VIII said, We declare, say, define, and pronounce that it is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature to be subject to the Roman Pontiff. Pope Clement VI said, No man outside obedience to the Pope of Rome can ultimately be saved. All who have raised themselves against the faith of the Roman Church and died in final impenitence have been damned and gone down to hell. Even in modern times, Pope John XXIII in 1958 declared, Into this fold of Jesus Christ no man may enter unless he be led by the sovereign pontiff and only if they be united to him can men be saved. In 1984, Pope John Paul II was quoted as saying, Don't go to God for forgiveness of sins. Come to me. The quote was based on a Los Angeles Times article which reported, rebutting a belief widely shared by Protestants and a growing number of Roman Catholics, Pope John Paul II dismissed the widespread idea that one can obtain forgiveness directly from God. Furthermore, according to traditional Catholicism, obedience to the papacy is said to be required no matter how dreadful the Pope might be. Catherine of Siena, one of the patron saints of Italy, whose mummified head is still preserved in Rome today, said, Even if the Pope were Satan incarnate, we ought not to raise up our heads against him, but calmly lie down to rest in his bosom. He who rebels against our Father is condemned to death, for that which we do to him, we do to Christ. We honor Christ if we honor the Pope. Such demands for blind obedience were confirmed by the Popes themselves, but confronted by the reformers, by men like... Okay, so... That's a, it's an excellent film. Sadly, though, there is the odd images of Christ, and uh, uh, we at Megato Films would be, and Megato Radio would be dead against that. Now, it's also important to note, and 
Got a few minutes left. Pope Francis is not only just sits in the, <laughs> sits in this blasphemous position of claiming to be the vicar of Christ, he's also a Jesuit. The Jesuits began in the 16th century, started by a man by the name of Ignatius of Loyola. His original name was Ignigo. Can't remember his second name, but anyway, but like of Loyola, he he grew up at the castle of Loyola. He was from royal, a royal kind of royal family, but had a very romantic view of the world. He wanted to go off and and conquer. You know, be very chivalrous and things like that. He wanted to be kind of a hero. And long story short, after going off into battle, he had his leg shattered by a cannonball. Had a reset, went through an awful amount of pain, spent months and months in the castle of Loyola, where he read two books, The Life of Christ by Ludolf of Saxony and The Golden Legend by Jacopo of Vares. Now, they were called the Society of Jesus, and they developed the nickname from their enemies mainly, the Jesuits, and the name stuck. He dedicated himself to the Black Virgin of the Abbey of Montserrat near Barcelona. Uh, he dedicated himself to Mary, not to Jesus Christ, but to Mary. And uh, the Society of Jesus was appointed in 1540 by Pope Paul II with the papal bull. And um, just to give you a little idea of the Jesuits, I mean... I can't remember who said this, but and it's it's completely true. Anybody reads Jesuit histories other than the Catholic propaganda whitewashing pieces that have been put out also through the centuries as well. But the vast majority of things, whether they've been written by honest Roman Catholics, atheists, and especially Protestants, J. Wiley, and various other people, have seen that the Jesuits may name, and if, for example, if Protestantism... To, uh, if Protestantism ceased, there would be no longer a need for Jesuits, for the Jesuits. Their whole aim, their whole goal is the eradication of Protestantism. And here's the thing. In the, in the Society of Jesus, the so-called Society of Jesus, in the Jesuits, Pope Francis is not the highest ranking. He has superiors, and at the very, very top is a man has a nickname, the Black Pope. And Protestantism, uh, Protestants for at least 100 to 150 years have been claiming, at least, I don't know how accurate it is. Necessarily, I'm inclined to believe it, but I need to study it further, that the papacy has been taken over by the Jesuits, and, and the papacy has been in control of the Jesuits. Oh, no, sorry. The Jesuits have been in control of the papacy for quite a long time. Now, you might say, oh, well, why did it take this long for a Jesuit pope? You could speculate. I mean, the Jesuits did not have a good reputation. For example, they were disbanded and banned in 1713, and uh, the pope at the time believed he signed his own death warrant. Indeed, he did. Within, a, within months, he was poisoned to death. This is in 1773, 1774, around then. They go underground. And then when they reemerge in 1814, they are stronger than they ever were before. Uh, evidently, they were planning. There's various theories that I've been reading in different books that they were underground, they were planning, and uh, they were still had connections, and they used various front groups to reach their aims, etc., and so on, and used various groups. Whether that is true or not, well, what is true, and what we do know is the Jesuits and the Council of Trent and everything involved in it is the enemy of the Bible, the enemy of Protestantism, the enemy of Calvinism. The Jesuit theology of Molinism, which is uh, espoused by William Lane Craig, and William Lane Craig is a big fan of Benedict XVI. Starting to see a bit of a connection here. Um, see, what happens is, if you believe in free will, and... And you see in First Peter that 
Scripture came. Oh, let's, uh, I'm just going to go to the passage. Second Peter, probably. Oh yeah, Second Peter chapter one verse twenty one. For prophes for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, if God, you see, the thing is, when God, if God is not completely sovereign over salvation, but eventually what happens is a lack of belief and faith eventually creeps in into, well, is the Bible completely inspired? It says here that men of God moved with the Holy Ghost. Well, there's still man's free will, and man's not a robot. So when he's writing the scriptures, were there some errors? This creeps in, and this is why. Gus's top lady rightly said, Arminianism is a road to Rome because it introduces... The professing Protestantism, at least it did back then, or reform circles, the doctrine, the deadly poison of free will. But it also, in the same way, it brings men perilously close to liberalism. And it's a, not to say that every Arminian is a, is a liberal. No, it's not true at all. But how many second generation Arminians become liberals? Not all, but a lot. And you might say, well, this happens in reform circles too. Yes, it does today. Why? Because we raise them like Arminians. We, we believe so much in free will and the autonomous nature of man. We say to our children, you decide. I know you're giving them over to the devil, but I digress. This is for another day. What kind of obedience, and I'm getting, this is a very good book, actually, written by David Cloud, and I think people are, if you've been listening to the show long enough, people are aware that uh, one of the men who helped me a lot when I was saved first was David Cloud. I was in fundamentalism for a, lo fundamentalism for a long time, but I also have a huge amount of problems with these books, but um, they are like an A to Z of quotations, and while I have a lot of the original sources over there, it's almost easier to quote from here. Now, this is from the spiritual exercise of Ignatius Loyola. And this just shows, like, again, Francis, Pope Francis has a superior in the, in the Jesuits. And we know, because of that, by virtue of that alone, and by virtue of this quote, that, that he is not the one who's in control of the Vatican. Let everyone persuade himself that he who lives under obedience should be moved and directed under divine providence by his superior, just as if he were a corpse which allows himself to be moved and led in any direction. Blind obedience, you surrender your will, your reason, to the superior in the society of Jesus. It says in another part of spiritual exercises, this is, uh, it says here, we must put aside all judgment of our own. Another part says, be on the alert to find reasons to defend them, etc. and so on. Um, if we, this is like the, the doctrines of the church, the regulations of the church, the mass, transubstantiation. Is that a secondary issue? But do we even have time to get into it in this show? If we wish to proceed securely in all things, we must hold fast to the following principle. This is the principle of the Jesuits. What seems to me, what seems to me white, I will believe black, if the hierarchical church so defines. Is this man a sincere Christ follower? No. If we look at some of the actions of the Jesuits throughout history. Well, the Bible is being translated from 1604, the King James Version of the Bible, 
known back then as the authorized version. Um, translation began in 1604, ended in 1611, but in the second year of translation, an attempt was made by a man by the name of Guy Fox, a Jesuit coadjutor, not actually a Jesuit, but a Jesuit coadjutor. And this is from a website on the history of it, was then sanctified by performing mass and ministering of the sacraments by the Jesuit priest John Gerard in an adjoining room. The Jesuit, it's known, pretty common knowledge, that Guy Fawkes Day, on the 5th of November, 1605, was a Jesuit plot to blow up king and parliament. And they think that the translation of the Bible probably had a lot to do with it. Quite an audacious plan. Many of them, the, the plotters were executed in and a lot of them are now, I think some of them are canonized and things like this. That's the thing. Rome twists history, calls them martyrs, and say they were persecuted. Muddies the waters. Uh, now, one last thing. Now, I covered this in a vlog during the week. The vlog was called Francis's Secret Jesuit Oath. This is on record in the Library of Congress. I'll give you the number, the catalog number, if you want to look it up. Which is logged back in, I just double-checked the year. I think it was back in, about 100 years ago it was put in. So... No, I probably won't be able to find it here now that I'm looking for it. Oh, yeah, here it is. I have the catalog number, but not when it was placed in the Library of Congress. But anyway, it has been, well, it obviously has been denied by the Jesuits. It's a secret oath. This is the oath when you want to go from novice or noviciate. I think that's how you pronounce it. It kind of a, an entry level. Now, most the novices haven't sworn this oath, to my knowledge, it's, and and so a lot of people will say, "Well, I've known well, an ex-Jesuit. Can you really trust?" You know, like if somebody says, "Well, I never heard of it," doesn't mean that they're telling the truth. Again, if you look at the principles of Jesuitism after reading the spiritual exercises, you realize that lying and all sorts of things, and theft and murder and everything, can be justified through their casuistry and sophistry. So, you know, always have to take a lot of what they say with a pinch of salt. But, uh, however, this is not the lower rank, you know, the, the entry level. You know, they'll, they'll study, and then eventually when they want to progress, it says at the start of this oath, when a Jesuit of minor rank is to be elevated to command, he is conducted into the chapel of the convert to the order, etc., and so on. And so this is when he's being, he's no longer the novice level, but he's going further and he's to become one of the superiors because every Jesuit has a superior above him and then he's a superior above him all the way up to the Black Pope, the Jesuit general. Is Pope Francis, now I don't expect, I don't expect Robert Jeffries to know, I didn't expect him to know this, but I'm going to include this in the record to show you that Pope Francis is not what he's showing to the world and what the liberal media and other media is swooning over and thinks is amazing. That he's a sincere Christ father. No, he's not. But what I would expect Robert Jeffries to know is that transubstantiation, for example, is a blasphemy, is a false it's a false gospel. The belief that the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is physically present in the wafer, and that the wafer actually changes, that it's no longer bread, it's no longer wine, and to say that is... I mean, if you look at the testimonies of Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley, this was the debate. 
we don't care about the sacraments anymore, apparently. Um, but that it, it was no longer wine, and this would get got them executed. They said, no, no, it is still wine. It is still bread. But we spiritually feast upon Christ. That's what many of the reformers, okay, there was some people like Zwingli who said, it's purely a memorial. Now, the memorial view is now the predominant view. There's four major views of the Lord's Supper. Uh, transubstantiation of Roman Catholicism, which sees the bread and wine being changed into actual physical blood of Christ, defying all reason and logic. Consubstantiation, which was Martin Luther's view, which was with con means with the bread and the wine was with the elements. It's still bread and still wine, but he was physically present. A a problematic view, to say the least, and um. He denied a lot of Rome's central heresies, but it's a it's a false it's a false view consubstantiation, and um, the reform view, the Calvinistic view, whatever you want to call it, um, which is held by many, was that we feast upon Christ. Yes, He is. There is a Christ is present in the Lord's Supper, and tomorrow my church will be observing the Lord's Supper. We we observe it every four months. And it's the entire service. It's not just a, a little addendum to the end of a service. And how do I put it? Or an appendix to the end of a service. Now, the but in a in a reaction against Rome, sadly, the sacraments are not treated as they ought to be. These are appointed by God. These are ordinances of, of God. They present visibly, they're the visible word, they, they present visibly the gospel. In baptism, the picture of being washed and, and being placed into Christ's body. And faith in that saves us. Faith, faith alone, not the sacraments, not this ipso facto automatic grace that Rome believes in. And also the bread and wine, we feast upon Christ. We we're in communion with him. We learn of him spiritually. And that's what John 6 is talking about. Believe on him. He, whosoever eat, eat my flesh and drink my blood. It was talking about belief. It was talking about trusting. It is spiritually eating and spiritually feasting upon Christ. Now, I'm going to leave it with this. That should be known by any minister entering the pulpit. They should know that Rome is an enemy of the gospel. Very, very minimal stuff. This is church history. This is understanding a tiny grain of the Reformation. To know that Rome, the Pope of Rome, began a sincere Christ father? But not only that, it's worse. This is part of the Jesuit, secret Jesuit oath in the Library of Congress. And it says near the end of the oath, I furthermore promise and declare that I will, when opportunity presents itself, make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly, against all heretics, Protestants and liberals, as I am directed to do, to extirpate and exterminate them from the face of the whole earth, that I will spare neither age, sex, or condition, that I will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up their stomachs and wombs of their women, crush and crush their infants' heads against the wall in order to annihilate forever their execrable race. Then, when the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poisonous cup, the strangulation cord, the steel of the poignard, or the leaden bullet, regardless of honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or persons, Whatsoever may be their condition, neither public or private, as I may be at any time be directed to so do by the agent of the Pope or superior of the blood of, of the brotherhood of the holy faith of the society of Jesus. And just read one more paragraph. This is to show who Francis is. He has sworn to self. He is in a high position. 
and the Jesuits. He was one of the highest ranking Jesuits in Argentina. In confirmation of which, I hereby dedicate my life, my soul, and all my corporeal powers. And with this dagger, which I now receive, I will inscribe my name written in my own blood, in testimony thereof, that I should prove false or weaken in my determination. May my brethren and fellow soldiers of the militia of the Pope cut off my hands and my feet and my throat from ear to ear, my belly opened and sulfur burned therein, with all the punishment that can be inflicted upon me on earth, and my soul be tortured by demons in an eternal hellfire. He swears an oath. He has sworn an oath that says, If he weakens in his determination, may my brethren and my fellow soldiers of the militia of the Pope cut off my hands and my feet and my throat from ear to ear, my belly opened and sulfur burned therein, and all the punishment that can be inflicted upon me on earth, and my soul be tortured by demons in eternal hellfire. Do we expect truth from such people who have sworn such blood-curdling oaths? May we pray against Antichrist for the destruction of Antichrist and for the advance of the kingdom of grace in our day. This has been Paul Flynn. May God bless you all.